All right, greetings, friends. After a bit of a delay, we are going to uh, pick up on the uh, story of Joseph where we left off. And so if you have your Bibles with me, turn to Genesis chapter 41. I'm not going to be reading the whole chapter. We're only going to be looking at half. And then next, uh, next Sunday, we'll finish uh, the second half of chapter 41. So if you have your Bibles with me, I'm going to uh, begin reading. I'll just read one verse from chapter 40. Uh, the last verse, which says, The chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, he forgot him. Chapter 41, When two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream, and he was standing by the Nile, when out of the river there came up seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed among the reeds. And after them, seven other cows, ugly and gaunt, came up out of the Nile and stood beside those on the river bank. And the cows that were ugly and gaunt ate up the seven sleek fat cows. And then Pharaoh woke up. He fell asleep again, had a second dream. Seven heads of grain, healthy and good, were growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other heads of grain sprouted, thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven healthy full heads. And then Pharaoh woke up. It had been a dream. In the morning, his mind was troubled. So he sent for all the magicians and the wise men of Egypt. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one could interpret them for him. And then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, Today I am reminded of my shortcomings. Pharaoh was once angry with his servants, and he imprisoned me and the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard. And each of us had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. Now a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. And we told him our dreams, and he interpreted them for us, giving each man the interpretation of his dream. And things turned out exactly as he interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position, and the other man was hanged. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. And when he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and no one can interpret it. But I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. And then Pharaoh said to Joseph, In my dream I was standing on the bank of the Nile, when out of the river there came up seven cows, fat and sleek, and they grazed among the reeds, and after them seven other cows came up, scrawny and very ugly and lean. I had never seen such ugly cows in all of the land of Egypt. The lean, ugly cows ate up the seven fat cows that came up first, but even after they ate them, no one could tell that they had done so. They looked just as ugly as before. And then I woke up. And in my dreams, I also saw seven heads of grain, full and good, growing on a single stalk. And after them, seven other heads sprouted, withered and thin and scorched by the east wind. And the thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven good heads. I told this to the magicians, but none could explain it to me. And then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of the Pharaoh are one and the same, and God has revealed to Pharaoh what he's about to do. The seven good cows are seven years. The seven good heads of grain are seven years. It's one and the same dream. The seven lean, ugly cows that came up afterward are seven years, and so are the seven worthless heads of grain scorched by the east wind. They are seven years of famine. It's just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is the matter has been firmly decided by God, and God will do it soon. Our Father, just pray that you will minister to each person who uh, watches this video. Pray that you would uh, speak into our hearts. We want to hear from you. We need to hear from you. <coughs> Lord, be praised in our time together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Now, um, just as we reflect in, on the life of Joseph, we uh, might be able to say that all people suffer in this life, but some people suffer so much more than everybody else. And Joseph, um, he lost his mother when he was very young. She died giving birth to his uh, younger brother. But Joseph ended up becoming uh, dad's favorite son, deeply loved by, uh, by his father. So that was a good thing in Joseph's life. But that good thing caused jealousy and envy in his brothers, and for that reason they hated him. And they plotted to murder him. And in the end, they sold him into slavery. Such was the story of Joseph. Joseph became a slave. But he had some other good things going for him. He was smart. He was a good worker. And so eventually, he got this really good position in his master's house, Potiphar's house. Um, and he was also a man of principle and another good thing that he had going for him was that he was a good-looking guy. But his slave master's wife took a liking to him, and he refused to lie with her, and so she accused him of sexual assault and attempted rape, and so he was sent into prison. But while in prison, some good things happened, and uh, he was given responsibilities, uh, over other prisoners and especially the the VIPs that were there and so he met two of them uh, and he they had they each had individual dreams and Joseph had some um, good gifts he was able to interpret their dreams and he said that one of them would be restored and the other one would die and he asked the one with a favorable outcome to remember him but as we read, he forgot Joseph. Just think of this, 13 years, about 13 years of Joseph's life, he lived as a slave. And the two last years, uh, he spent in prison uh, in shackles. So from his late teens and right through all of his 20s, he spent as a slave. You think you've had it hard. Now, as we reflect on his life and everything that he went through, what can we expect from this young man who all his life suffered? All his life, he was a victim, a true victim. Now, I've heard many experts, and I have no doubt that they would predict that inevitably that this young man is going to be angry. He's going to be full of rage. We can, we can expect that he's going to be antisocial, that he's going to be anti-family, that he's going to be anti-woman, that we can expect that perhaps that he's going to be an atheist, or at least if he believes in God, he is going to be very angry with God because God ruined his life. God didn't stop all these terrible things from happening to him. We can expect that if ever he gets the chance, he is going to take revenge on all his enemies. And I think most of us would sympathize and say, you know, no doubt this individual is going to be really messed up for the rest of, of his life. I mean, look at what happened to him. His life was wasted. He experienced so much injustice from other people. Right? Isn't that what we would expect? But behold, when we read about Joseph's life, that's not what we find. That's not what, what ended up happening. Why? Because what, what so many experts forget, what folk forget is the work and the power of God in a person's life. What many don't take into account is the power of faith to bring strength and to bring hope, and to bring meaning, and to bring healing into somebody's life. Genuine, God-given faith can steady a person, even under the most difficult of circumstances. Faith can raise him above some of the most difficult circumstances that he has to go through. Faith can give a person a heavenly perspective. One day... Joseph is going to utter these famous words. 
You meant it unto me as evil, but God meant it unto me as good. Take God out of the picture. Take God out of Joseph's life, and all he has left is evil to reflect on. All he has left is injustice to reflect on. You meant it unto me as evil. And that's no doubt would lead to rage and rebellion and revenge. But biblical faith in God, a person is able to look at life and say, but he, he meant it unto me as good. And it changes everything. You know, Joseph's life really points us forward to the life of Jesus, who also suffered throughout his life, suffered so much that he was called a man of sorrows and one well acquainted with grief. All his life he suffered injustice, lies, and mistreatment. And one day he ends up on the cross, and he's an innocent man when he ends up on that cross. And he was put there by his own people and by the state. The Roman state soldiers did that. And what does he do? He prays for the forgiveness of his enemies. And Jesus gave his life for their salvation. And although his own people had betrayed him and mistreated him, and the, the police state had done him wrong. He never asked his followers to take revenge. You know, if Jesus had prayed for justice, for God's justice to fall upon the guilty, who would stand? He would say to everybody, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. All of us would be damned. All of us would be condemned. But here is the sinless Son of God modeling love and mercy towards sinners. That's what he lived for. That's what he worked towards. I tell you, the gospel, the gospel when it's shared in word and shown in deed, the gospel alone is what will heal and transform sinners and cultures and nations and peoples that are divided it's the gospel now as we look at joseph's life and we reflect from beginning to end we just see that it's it's a story of ups and downs that is at home his father raises him up to be his favorite son but his brothers bring him down and let him down into the pit, selling him into slavery. But then out of, out of when he comes out of that pit, he's brought into a um, Potiphar's house where he becomes the greatest of all servants. But then he's brought down into a prison cell because of Mrs. Potiphar's false accusation. And then as we read, after two years in prison, he is being summoned from Pharaoh, from the prison to the palace. And God was with him in the ups. God was with him in the downs. He's with him during those times of drama. And he's with him in those times of monotony and suffering. You know, Joseph must have thought that, at times anyways, that he had God figured out. You know, he had been given this dream when he was in his early teens, and uh, he must have thought, oh, now I know what my life is going to be all about. But then his life takes these twists and turns that, I mean, what on earth is God doing? And then when he ends up in Potiphar's house, you know, and he rises to the top, he must have said, oh, now I see what God is up to. But then he ends up in prison. He must have thought, I don't know what God is up to. And then there's these two fellows that end up in prison. And he interprets their dreams. And he must have thought, you know, now that I've, I've uh, interpreted the, their dreams, I mean, this is, this is going to be my ticket to freedom. But nothing happens. For two years, nothing happens. And he's forgotten. 
you know, for the most part, I don't think we know what God is up to in our life or how he's going to get us out of our dire circumstances. His ways are mysterious. Every time you think you've got God figured out, you know, he throws a curveball. Something happens that you didn't count on. You know, just don't try and figure this all out. Just be still. Know that he is God. Trust him. That's all we can do. That's all we can do. So it's so important for God's people to learn to wait upon the Lord. And if the door closes in your face, just wait. Serve. Pray. You know, if the, heart, the hearts of other peoples are cold and hard against you, just wait. Serve the Lord. Pray. You know, if the person that you have done good to forgets you, mistreats you, just wait. Serve the Lord. Pray. I mean, if God has given you direction, he gave you a dream, a calling, an assurance, but nothing has happened, just wait on the Lord. Serve him where you are. Just continue to pray. Now, Joseph has been in prison for two years, and he wakes up, and it's a day like every other day, just another boring day ahead of him. But unbeknownst to, did I say David? It's Joseph. Unbeknownst to Joseph, um, Pharaoh had two consecutive dreams. And these dreams were different from all other dreams. Because most dreams, they're just full of nonsense. They're empty, confusing. But on this occasion, it was God who had given him these dreams. Lord, have you not heard of the separation between God and state, between God and politics? Are you getting involved? Are you trying to influence a leader? You're only allowed to work in the church and amongst people who believe in you. Isn't that what a lot of people think? So what is this that we're reading here of God influencing a pagan politician? He's receiving divine communication. You know, this is the third time that we read about dreams in the uh, story of Joseph. And each time they take place in groupings of two. Right? Joseph had two dreams. If you put the cupbearer and the baker together, they each had one dream uh, simultaneously. And so that makes two. And now Pharaoh has two dreams. So that's six dreams total. And each of these dreams, each dream is prophetic. They tell of things to come, things that will happen. And in each case, the dreams are shared. It seems that nobody is able to really keep these dreams to themselves. Um, they always seem to come out. They seem to compel people to speak. When Joseph shared his dreams, the interpretation seemed somewhat self-evident to his brothers and the father. They don't require any special gift to interpret them. However, whenever we read of an Egyptian having a dream, Two things happen. One, they are deeply troubled. They are deeply troubled. And secondly, the interpretation of the dream is not self-evident to the person who's dreaming it. So we need to ask the question, what, what's the point of God giving Pharaoh, this pagan Egyptian king, a dream that he can't understand? that he can't interpret. What's the point? Well, the scriptures tell us, this story tells us, in each case, God gave the Egyptians a dream. He did it to orchestrate a meeting with Joseph, the man of God. This is God's doing. This is God's providence. 
Think of it. Who would ever imagine that Joseph, an Israeli, a prisoner, would be summoned to meet Pharaoh the king, the most powerful ruler on earth in that day? I mean, what do they have in common? How is it possible that these two are going to meet and have a conversation with one another? Right? Only God can make the unlikely and the impossible happen. And that's what happens. But first, you know, Pharaoh reveals his dreams to his wise men. And we read, but there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. You notice in this story, three times we read that, that no one could interpret the dream. Verse 18, verse 15, verse 24. Just think of it. I mean, if they could have interpreted the dream, the meeting with Joseph would never have taken place. So their failure to interpret the dreams, Pharaoh's dreams, uh, was part of God's doing. Now, I have to say, on a side note, that I, I'm somewhat perplexed by the fact that these so-called wise men, these magicians, the brightest of the brightest in Egypt, did not try and give an answer to, uh, to Pharaoh. Why didn't they bluff? That's what so many people do today. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't understand stuff. But they bluff. They pretend like they know. They... They come out with these confident theories that they know what's taking place. Why didn't these men do that? Um, here's what I think. Remember what happened to people who displease Pharaoh? Right? They end up in jail. They end up being hung. And it reminded me of uh, when I lived in Montreal. I recall watching these TV shows where uh, people would call in and they would talk to a psychic. And this psychic claimed that they, they would be able to give guidance and they knew the future. So you just had to tell them their, your birthday and you had to tell them a, a, you know, a few facts and what kind of question you wanted answered, give them some details. And of course, remember, this is a dollar a minute, right? And uh, they would give an answer. And there was no way for those of us who were watching to uh, see if their predictions came true. But I suspect, I suspect that some of their advice didn't come to pass and that many of them got sued. Why? Because, you see, at the bottom of the screen, there was, in small print, you could read this, for entertainment purposes only. These magicians knew that the stakes were high. This was not for entertainment only. If they got it wrong, they would lose their head. You deceived Pharaoh, and he would not take it lightly. You know what else this teaches me? That their inability to interpret dreams shows the impotence of pagan wisdom to understand the work of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, Paul says this, Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? Here's the bottom line, that uh, God's work requires God's interpretation. If we don't have God's word explaining to us what God is doing, what God has done, we're going to live in ignorance. And people are just bluffing and pretending like they know. If God didn't explain to us the reason for why we're here, or explain to us the meaning of the cross and the resurrection, we would never be able to conclude that Jesus was dying for the sins of the world and was raised for our justification and salvation. God's work requires God's word. And likewise, in this case, God gave people dreams 
They know that they're meaningful and significant, but they don't have any idea what it's about. Not until God gives the interpretation. So, what do we read? Pharaoh shares his dreams and his wise men don't know what to do. They're at a loss. And then this cupbearer says in verse 9, I remember my offenses today. The writer uh, Madeleine uh, Lengel has a quote. Why does it seem so often to be a human quality that we forget those who have done good things for us and yet we remember those who have hurt us? This cupbearer remembers, and I would say this, this remembering is, is, is of God. And what does he remember? Well, he remembers the interpretation of Joseph. And he, and he shares this with Pharaoh. And he says, in essence, you know, his interpretations were 100% accurate. So listen, Pharaoh. This young Jewish prisoner knew what you were going to do, perhaps even before you commanded it and thought it. There was no way for him to know this, but he knew it. And secondly, I will say this about him. He is a truth teller. He tells it as it is. He doesn't sugarcoat anything. He told me I would be restored, and he told the baker he would be hanged. You've got somebody in that prison that you can trust. So, of course, Pharaoh, how does he respond? He says, okay, get him here. And this is what we read. So they quickly brought him out of the pit. I mean, first he's cleaned up, he's shaved, he's made presentable, and before you know it, Joseph is standing in the presence of Pharaoh. My goodness, when it's God's time for things to happen, they happen, and they happen quickly. And I'm reminded of the thief on the cross. There he is suffering, and the shadow of death is upon him. And Jesus says to him, today you will be with me in paradise. From the cross to paradise today, from death to life today, Here's another verse, in a flash or in an instant. In the twinkling of an eye, the, the, the last trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. This is how quick it will all happen. And so it is with Joseph, from the pit to the palace. Joseph is standing in front of Pharaoh and I think, in essence, this is what Pharaoh says, uh, Joseph, I need your help. I need your expertise. I hear you can interpret dreams and nobody around here can do it. So can you do it? And Joseph, even before he hears the dream, he wants to set the record straight. It's fascinating. Verse 15, he says this, It is not in me, or it is not of me, but God. God will give you a favorable answer. See, I can't claim to be a wise man like the Egyptians. I can't claim that I, you know, uh, uh, I, I'm just well read. No, I, I can't do that. I, this, this is God's doing. It's, it's not mine. The glory will belong to him. So just, you know, here he was in prison, two years, 13 years as a slave, what do we find in this young man? Joseph has been growing in his faith. Joseph has grown in humility, grown in his confidence in God, grown in his courage, grown in his relationship with God, and, and he just wants his life to be all about giving God glory. He's not angry with God like we thought. This young man honors God, gives him the glory. That's the first thing he does. Do we ever give God the glory when people ask us something or, or when people uh, 
compliment us or you know, have we ever take an opportunity to give God the glory? Uh, I just read this uh, about um, uh, I just read this story and uh, it's about Dr. Walkie. Dr. Walkie was uh, one of my professors at Regent College and he also uh, was a regular speaker at the uh, church that I attended at the Metropolitan Tabernacle. And um, so this is a story that uh, Dr. Haddon Robinson uh, shared. He said he went to the bank uh, one day with uh, Dr. Bruce Walkie, and apparently the, um, the bank teller gave Dr. Walkie too much money. And uh, Dr. Walkie, you know, looked and counted, and, uh, and then he said, uh, he said to her, he said, uh, you've given me too much. You've made a mistake here. And then apparently he followed up by saying this, look, I'm not pointing this out because I'm an honest man, but rather because Jesus Christ is my Lord. He didn't want her to think that his, his integrity and his honesty was that, that somehow it, it stemmed from his own good nature. He wanted her to know that the Lord had changed my life. I am what I am by the grace of God. You know, there's times, uh, friends, and may God give us discernment to know those times, when we need to set people's records straight. It, it's not me. I am what I am by the grace of God. Anyway, so he listens carefully to the details and to the dreams and um, and he says to Pharaoh, Pharaoh, both of both your dreams speak of one message. Okay, it's, it's just like one issue here. And then he says in verse twenty-five and twenty-eight, I love this. He says, God has revealed to Pharaoh what he's about to do. You get that? Um, this is what God is about to do. What's, what's about to happen in Egypt is not an accident. It's not just nature taking its course. It's not, it's not just foresight of what will happen. It is God's sovereign action. This is what God is about to do. God is going to do something that will determine the next 14 years of Egypt's economy. Wow. You know, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't moralize here. He doesn't say that God is rewarding them for being so good and that for seven years he's going to bless them. And he doesn't say, look, God is going to do this out of judgment, There's no, you know, because you've been so evil. He doesn't say any of that. But he does say that God is the one who is going to bring this about. For seven years, there will be prosperity and abundance in Egypt, but the next seven years, there will be great famine. And the famine will consume the land. It will be very severe. That's what he says to Pharaoh. So once again, you know, Joseph is called to speak words of encouragement and blessing. But likewise, he's also called to speak words of warning. It was the same with the cupbearer and the baker. Same thing happened. He spoke positively to one and negatively to the other because that was what God was going to do. So what is required of a prophet of God? What is required of a Bible teacher? What is required of a man who interprets the dreams of God? What is required of every Christian? In the conversations he has, faithfulness to the text, faithfulness to God's revelation, faithfulness to God's word. <clears throat> and we can say, we can say that if there's someone who only speaks good words, who is always and only positive, where there's never a warning, he only speaks of health and wealth and of heaven, but he never tells you of hell. And he speaks always of love, but never of judgment. Don't listen to them. They are false prophets. They lie. Just like these fortune tellers that I used to listen to. 
stood out to me that their prediction was always positive. They always tickled the ears of those who had called. God is calling people who can speak the good news of the gospel and the warnings of judgment. Tell the truth, speak the truth in love, but leave the consequences with the Lord. So let me, let me just pause and do that as one called to share the word of God with you who are listening. I must tell you the good news that you were created in the image of God. He created you to have a relationship with him. He created you in love, in wisdom. He created you for, uh, for his pleasure, for good things to happen in your life. All of that is good news. But we have turned from God. We have sinned. Every single one of us. There is none righteous, no, not one. We sinned. We can't put the blame on God. It's our responsibility. But yet God didn't give up on you. But rather, out of love and concern for you, he sent his son to live the life that we should have lived, to suffer the consequences of our sins that we should have suffered, and to die a death that we should have died. He did all of that. He suffered hell for us, the hell that we deserved. And he did all of this out of grace and mercy and love. And so here's the good news. Here's the challenge. If you accept Jesus, receive Jesus, trust Jesus, you will be saved. You will be forgiven. And it will be because of what he did. He did it all. He paid it all. But if you reject Jesus, you don't believe in Jesus. You play around with Jesus. Play around with faith. Play around with, with what it means to be a Christian. Then you're on your own. You have no advocate to stand next to you on the day of judgment. You will have no leg to stand on because you will see you are guilty like the rest of us. And there will be nothing to justify you. And then you will have to suffer the consequences of your sin. And so God sends his people, his teachers, to remind us of, of, of the dire circumstances that are coming, to warn everybody and to tell them the good news of salvation. Heaven and hell is before you. Salvation and damnation is before you. Choose wisely. Bow the knee to Jesus. As for the rest of us, I, I don't know where you are in your life journey. You know, maybe you are riding the waves. You're on the mountaintop. Well, I would say don't forget to praise God and thank him. It's not an accident that things are going well for you. But at the same time, I would say don't forget the Lord. Um, grow in your faith. Become strong in him. Because nobody in this life is up at that, on that mountaintop forever. Nobody is going to be riding the waves forever. Not in this life. And friends, if you're in the valley, you know, let's learn the lessons that uh, we, we read here in, in the life of Joseph. That just because you don't see God working or answering your prayers doesn't mean that he's, he's, work, that he's not working. He is working. He is working behind the scenes. We just can't see what he's doing. Secondly, you know, if you've been in that situation for a long time, how long, oh Lord, how long? It doesn't mean that, that God's not going to change things around. He did it for Joseph, and he can do it for you. In the meantime, wait upon the Lord. Trust him. Grow in him. Pray to him. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. And when his time has come, when his perfect, perfect time has come, he will turn things around. For now we are called to be still and to know that he is God. May the Lord bless the, the reading and the preaching of his word.